Hopefully you'll have, uh, well, some of you, some of you will have got the message actually. I realised I didn't put it on the main channel. Um, Nadia is uh, well, but she's a bit tired. She's had a bit of a crap night because she's had her vaccine. So she's, uh, she's nursing herself upstairs. She's just recuperating. That's Chi Chi who's just dropped my knee bone, knee joint on the floor. Um, first of all, Catherine Preston, welcome as a family guest. I see that you've been trying for ages. Today, the techno gods were on my side. Might even try connecting to my TiVo box later. Yeah, do it later. You don't really don't want a big fat close up of my ugly face. Um, but yeah, so Nad sends her apologies. Um, and uh, we're also gonna be moving me being a twat in the kitchen from tonight to tomorrow night um, at about 6.30. Uh, and obviously tomorrow night we're gonna be uh, responding to and discussing some of the topics that come up in the Caroline Flack documentary. But uh, she's well, obviously, but we, I hear that lots of people have sort of a, a bit of a peaky time, don't they? After the Oxford AstraZeneca. I think <laughs> uh, we've been vlogging Nadia going through the process of getting a vaccine and we've been um, connecting an awful lot with, uh, a, you know, a lovely friend Lisa, who was having her vaccine exactly the same time as Nadia. Um, and uh, it's been very, it's been very funny actually. So it's, it's, that's going to go up in the vlog soon. Um, Emma Staple, you're getting your vaccine today. A little bit nervous, but mostly relieved. Absolutely. Don't, don't fret. Don't fret. I mean, obviously, as I said to Nad, it would be nice, wouldn't it, for the the one time that she's kind of jumped uh, head first into sort of almost conventional medicine. Um, that there wasn't all this press and coverage about the Oxford AstraZeneca um, vaccine. Uh, being banned in virtually, you know, every other European country at the moment. Um, morning, Denise Nelson Gale. I hope you're feeling a bit better, darling. I hope you're feeling better. Um, sending big love. Um, it's a funny time, isn't it? It's, it's positive, negative, positive, negative, up, down, up, down, up, down. I had a real moment last night, um, just towards the end of the evening, where it wasn't like a, it wasn't like a sort of major crisis or anything but I was just thinking oh my god you know I, I, I wish I could join people in the sort of celebratory element of coming out of lockdown I, I mean obviously I can join people but I mean you know what I mean it's like yeah just oh I want to be able to just oh the, the people will be able to kick back and meet friends and get pubs and drink and then you look at it and you think you can't book a table in a pub until August you can't book a table in most places till god knows when so um again it's, it's I don't think it's all going to happen as in one big go but boy, do we do I want to be at the party having as much fun as everyone else. Um, which is why I posted on my Instagram some party trees last night. Um, so I will send I will send Nadia all of your love. Thank you for all of your messages on the um, <laughs> WAG Club. Here we come. Oh my god, I remember the WAG Club. Jesus. Um, Toffee wandering around. Yeah, the dogs get a little bit sort of weird when they know someone in the house isn't feeling particularly good. She's feeling great though. I mean, she she said she she felt hot in the night. I mean, I'll let her speak for herself whenever she comes on. Uh, she felt, felt hot in the night, a uh, bit of a temperature, open the window, tossing and turning. Sounds like a normal night really for her, to be honest with you. And I'll tell you one thing, she didn't snore. So that's one one huge byproduct of the uh, Astra's, Oxford AstraZeneca. It might remove snoring, you never know. Um, so she had the Oxford AstraZeneca, yeah. Um, trying to chill and be positive, Denise. That says, as it should be, good on you. Take it easy and feel no guilt about it. That's the problem. Uh, Bobby Ward, I have all sorts of health problems, but was fine with my Oxford vaccine. Just the usual tender area where needle went in and having a, had a heart attack and stent a few years ago, I've been okay. Yeah, she hasn't actually even had the tenderness in her arm. I did get her to do, uh, I mean, they were pretty, pretty pathetic, but I got her to do some... Uh, press ups, you know that, that you know she was doing that Zach Bush flying your arms around. Well, as soon as you have it, if you do this, it spreads it around your body more. Um, so yeah, for anyone watching with the sound down, it, uh, I'm not trying to get rid of body odor, though I know it looks like it. Um, just seeing friends in garden will be nice, says Sue Gilbert. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, I suppose for those of us who, because a lot of people will be feeling a little bit anxious about, you know, I've heard it from like Maddie and her friends and, and kids at school. Am I buffering for everyone or am I buffering for just a few? Um, is it buffering or is it okay? It's looking okay on my screen. Um, perfect, yeah, I think it's okay. It might, it could be your end. Sometimes it buffers at your end, not just our end. You could be the bufferer, me not the bufferer. It tends, that's why we have it up on the screen here too, so that I can see what our feed, feed is like, and then if it goes, I'll flick over. Um, 
completely forgot what I was going to say there. What was I starting to say? Before you're buffering, buffering, buffering. Yes. Oh, yeah. Social anxiety and all that kind of stuff. I mean, we talk, we've talked a lot about it on Confessions of a Modern Parent. And um, do check out, actually, our most recent one, because it's about kids who and families for whom going back to school isn't just a great thing. I mean, obviously, writ large, it's a brilliant thing. But, you know, uh, many children who go to school are unhappy. And, um, and so, you know, hearing everyone go, yay, school's back for ever. Um, isn't necessarily a brilliant thing. So I think there are a lot of people for whom coming out of lockdown will be quite a nervy moment because, of course, it's suddenly, you know, will there be a rush back to that social competitive FOMO and all that kind of stuff? Do you know what I mean? So keeping up, I mean, half of the stresses of life aren't just work stresses and, and all of that living stuff, but it's also socialising, isn't it? It's, it's, is my social circle big enough? Have I got friends? Can I keep friends? Why is that friend being a twat? All that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think, you know, again, it's, it's important to remind ourselves that we, as we, we're going to unfurl, aren't we? We're going to unfurl like the buds of spring. We're going to unfurl like blossom. Uh, and slowly and surely they'll be in our garden, we'll be in each other's gardens, we'll be, uh, then we'll be in each other's houses and all things like that. It'll be gradual. It'll be gradual. Um, I didn't think I'd be trying to book a pub garden as a recovering alcoholic, but I'm trying to find one. I want to take Maddie out to buy her her first drink from her dad. Prince Philip has just left the King Edward VII Hospital. The man is made of titanium. Prince Philip has walked out. I don't know if he's walked out, but he's left the King Edward Hospital. And his last words were, I won't be back. That man is... They don't make him like that anymore. And apparently he's booked a flight to LA to have a chat with his grandson. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Can you imagine? He comes out and goes, right, get me to Heathrow now. Titanium and the best ever care and medicine too. Yeah, he does, but he is, he's royalty. I suppose I just accept that. I mean, I know we could all get a bit quibbly about why has he got it and no one else has got it. I agree, I agree. Uh, Yinka Ajibola, is he dead? No, well, unless he's the walking dead. Uh, <laughs> he's just come out. He's like, he's been it, he's done it. He's seen it all. He rolled his car. He rolled his car. He crashed. He smashed up his car, rolled it, got out, dusted himself down, headed back to the uh, gaff, which was a castle. He's been in. He's had some stent work. He's ninety nine. He's like, go on, prop up my prop up my arteries one more time. And they've done it. And he's come out. I've got to say, he gives inspiration to all noctogenarians. What is a 90-year-old? Is it a nenogenarian? Noctogenarian? I mean, he'll be a centurion in June. He's 100 in June. Bloody hell. I wonder if the Queen will, like, write her telegram and just pass it to him over brekkie or across the pillow. Here you go, Phil. Well done. That's great news for the royal family. Very strong man. I think people should stop driving at 80. <laughs> Actually. He is the Terminator. He came out and walked down the stairs. I will not be back. He said it in that joke. Is he German? No, he's Greek heritage, isn't he? Doesn't he come from the Greek royal family or something like that? And apparently, you know, one of the things that a lot of the royals put a lot of their longevity down to is their keen homeopaths. Did you know that? Yeah. Uh, 99 is the new 60, says Amma Nail. Nail. Hope I've pronounced your name right. Amma Nail. Uh, I think you're right. I'm looking forward to being 99. I'm looking forward to kind of cutting a stride. Yeah, he's Greek, she's German. That's right, thanks, Reem. Um, yeah, that's quite nice news though, isn't it? It's quite nice news. Hi, Mark, can't keep up, need time out, off to bed, night hunt. Vanessa Hoggett, sleep tight. Tuck yourself up, make yourself a hot water bottle. Uh, I don't know where you are in the world, where are you? Or maybe you're here, I don't know. Um, make yourself a nice oval team if they have it there. I watched a documentary on his mother, Amazing Watch, Janine Amory. All oh, right, oh, that'd be interesting. Uh, Woody, just wanted to say, well done on how to stay married so far. Tough subject. It, it was, wasn't it? Nads and her experience was tough to hear. Agreed completely that most of us girls will have an experience and it's normal to hear of them. Yeah, I, I do think it's, I think it's important for the brothers, sons, fathers, grandfathers even, to hear the stories of their female loved ones because sometimes it's only in the hearing of a story that yes, it will fire up your emotions and your frustrations, but there's nothing more sort of, 
There's nothing that, that will generate a call to action or, or force you to think when you have emotional skin in the game. Do you know what I mean? I think sometimes we can think about these things in the abstract. And we're going to talk about plain clothed officers, which they're talking about putting in nightclubs and pubs and things. Um, you can think of these things in the abstract and you can get cross in the abstract, but unless it affects you, it's very hard to get that, what I call skin in the game. And I think, in, in, you know, it's a weird one, but I think almost part of the solving and educating and making men realize the extent of the problem is for women to no longer stay silent about the low level experiences they have. Do you know what I mean? Um, ED, honestly, love the female convo. I've had so many experiences. I never drink when I go out with friends. I'm young 20s, but even drinking like girls do not want to be impaired. I mean, yeah, you don't even think about that. Think about that for a moment. So men don't have to think about getting, you know, how drunk they get. I mean, they do, obviously. I mean, look, when I say all of this, there's an enormous amount of violence, as we all know, that can happen between men and towards men from men. Um, but, uh, you know, men by and large will not be thinking about not having a drink because they're worried they're going to get sexually assaulted by and large, uh, um, and women do, you know, and, and it sort of impacts on the, the kind of evening they have. I mean, I know for a fact that when I know any of my older girls are going out or are out or, or Nadia's out, or when I was younger when my mum was going out, um, I would worry about how much they drink and how not vulnerable they were making themselves, but how vulnerable they could be to the, you know, the wrong person. It's, it's, it's tough. Um, Michelle Mann, woman to stand... I think that's symbolic of, of the state of news in this country now. The BBC is the last news outlet to cover the Duke of Edinburgh, uh, to, to cover Prince Philip coming out. Uh, I was just reading Jeremy Clarkson going, having an absolute... I mean, and I don't align myself with Jeremy Clarkson politically, but he does make me laugh. But I've had the same disappointment in BBC news coverage that he was describing last night. They're slow, they're... Their, their analysis is so is so superficial. It's so surface. It, it's such a disappointment. I know I worked for the BBC for years. It used to be a place where you could go for really good analytical news. It's it's, it's crap. It really is. Um, Courtney C. Oh no, missed the start of the live. I had it on pause and thought it was just waiting for you to go, guys, to go like, oh dear, Courtney. Well, at least you can re rewind and, and check it out. Uh, <clears throat> Oscar nominations happened yesterday. I don't know if anyone saw that. Kind of very little interest in it this year. I, I mean, I didn't even cover it. We would have normally covered it for the Popcorn Junkies, but um, but there are, you know, lots of lots of British British contenders in there, which is good. But um, we'll talk about that later. So anyway, um, did anyone else see um, the news story, which is curiously absent from a lot of people's, um, from a lot of news gatherers, uh, online news um, sites. The inappropriate message sent from the cop who was guarding or uh, looking after the crime scene uh, of the Sarah Everard case. It made me, it made my blood boil. Yes, Lee, no, absolutely. He, he walked out with uh, one, one eye, was beaming a red laser out of it. He burnt the handle off the car, the, pulled the door off, got in and said, I will not be back. Quite astonishing. They've got the footage on uh, Sky News. Um, I was absolutely flabbergasted by the inappropriate message. Now, it wasn't a photograph. It wasn't. I, th I think it was a joke. I think it was a graphic joke. Graphic as in, I think not graphic, as, well, maybe graphic as in extreme. But for me, within that detail, within that detail is a far, is as chilling um, an example of what women are potentially faced with when asked to just trust the police force. I won't go into it again. We've had our own experience of not being taken seriously or being questioned about the veracity of what we've seen in our own relatively low level case of experiencing harassment on the street. Um, a woman has allegedly uh, allegedly reported after the vigil at the weekend, allegedly reported having been flashed at by a man on the way home, and the male police officer didn't take her seriously, and two WPCs had to be sent round to her house um, to apologise uh, for the fact that the male counterpart didn't take it seriously. So you're looking at just two examples that we know about 
there. One, and this one was, I think it broke on LBC last night, the one about the uh, police officer guarding the crime scene. We're then supposed to trust that there isn't an endemic problem within the police force in its attitudes to taking sexual harassment and sexual crime seriously. When a police officer can stand on the site of Sarah Everard's uh, potential murder and do that and not have any emotional capacity to consider how inappropriate that is, it frightens me. That frightens me. I mean, there's been many cases of these sorts of things in the past, in, incidentally, where cops will send photos of, of bodies and see, you know, and it's, you know, in many regards, I don't want this part of the story to get lost beneath the bigger part of the story because the sending of that text, let's think about this for a minute. The sending of that text, that person felt safe enough morally and professionally to send something like that to whom? Presumably to someone or some people that he thought would find it amusing, which in a sense in itself is a reflection on a wider group of people again. So that little drop in the ocean isn't just a isolated incident. You see how it spreads out. And as it spreads out, you then start to ask yourself, well, what's the tapestry of attitudes within the police force? Now, that is not to say that everyone in the police force is a sexist or would do this. But when you have these kind of things, when you have these kind of um, acts being picked up, you have to ask yourself, what, at the recruitment stage, is there any psychological assessment of these people being put on the streets? You know, it's a big question. And it, I think in many regards, obviously there's the awfulness of the Sarah Everard case, but then to have something like this, the disrespect and the lack of any moral compass is, is petrifying, I think, petrifying. Anyway, so, you know, so inappropriate message from the a cop, at the a crime scene cop um, on the Sarah Everard case. And now the government is suggesting, uh, it's very hard for the, Laura Lou, thank you, my dad's a policeman, it's very hard for the good ones to go through this, you're absolutely right. And talking again about our How to Stay Married yesterday about the importance of men, you know, male police officers who are frustrated by this need to talk to um, other male police officers about this. This is, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it literally, it, it, it confounds my brain. My brain simply can't contain the concept of it. Um, Dawn Clarico, so I was flashed at when I had my daughter with me in, my, in her buggy. The police let him off because he was drunk after splitting up with his girlfriend. I mean, the ra he, like that, the rationalising of, of, of why someone's done it is just awful. Um, it's only me. Look into the Biber Henry and Nicholas Smallman. They sent inappropriate images of the bodies at the height of BLM in a police WhatsApp group. Almost a year on, nothing's happened. It's remarkable, isn't it? It's remarkable. So when we stand and say, you know, in the, in the calmness and coolness of our home where we have no one in our lives that's been affected by any form of harassment and we say things like, oh, there shouldn't be vigils because of, of COVID, I think, I think you're kind of denying the fact that sometimes there's an emotional necessity to express yourself sometimes. And so long as it doesn't mean that you're harming anyone else, the emotional necessity to express yourself is an absolute right. And I do think everyone's right. Yesterday we touched upon it, but didn't go into it. We do need to worry about Priti Patel's new laws. Um, you might not agree with the opinions and you might not agree with the actions of some of these uh, pressure groups, if you like. But if you remove the right to be able to express opposition or, or frustration, I'll tell you what will happen. You never get rid of that feeling. You only drive it underground. You'll never get rid of the political frustration. I mean, like if you were to ban Extinction Rebellion, they're not, not gonna do what they're gonna do. So why not listen to what they're saying? I'm not saying necessarily everything they did was correct, but do you know what I mean? It's, it's dialogue is the only way forward. Um, so yeah, so one of the suggestions that the government is suggesting at the moment is uh, plain clothed officers, plain clothes officers in nightclubs and pubs. Um, there's a there's quite a clamour 
of people saying, well, it's not enough. Well, no, no, it's not enough. And, and it can't just be that. <laughs> You're once again faced with this problem, guys. If you can't guarantee that the men of those plainclothes police officers, um, if you can't guarantee that they have the right attitude to sexual politics, how can you trust that they're going to really be able to do their job? Do you know what I mean? If you've got cases of people at crime scenes and cases of police officers at a vigil against sexual harassment, denying <laughs> sexual harassment and exploiting it for entertainment purposes, how can you guarantee? So I think it's a great thing to start with this, but I think there needs to be something and there needs to be some element in the recruitment and the training that's a little bit like what we're suggesting there needs to be in the citizenship lessons at school. We've got to, we've, obviously we've got to educate about this. Not only educate kids, you've also got to educate institutions. And I think, you know, the police force needs to be re-educated re at a certain level about attitudes and approaches to things. Tutti Fruit, a man flashes in public and the cops make excuses for him, yet a woman breastfeeds in public and she's subject to harassment and hate. It's quite a contrast, isn't it? Uh, Rachel Louise, quite often men are in groups harassing us with their friends, stood around laughing. They find it funny, but don't consider the effect it has, especially on young girls. Now, I agree. Well, we touch upon that in um, our How to Stay Married. I mean, it's a very, it's a very, I mean, I, I you know, this is a slightly different situation, but I remember getting into a terrible fight with a guy who was being abusive to his, his own girlfriend. So he wasn't in a group of men. There were other men there, um, but, and I got... You know, I, I couldn't, he was hitting her and I, I, so I waded in and a friend of mine pulled me off and all this kind of stuff. Um, and interestingly, the woman in that situation wasn't at all appreciative that I'd, I'd sort of weighed in. I, I thought I was doing something good and I should have just basically kept my, myself to myself. But, um, but yeah, that, that sort of group in a pub is incredibly intimidating, incredibly intimidating. Uh, or can be, can be, you know, and... Uh, you know, if you're one member of that group of men, uh, you know, having been in, having been in, not groups that have ever been outwardly sort of prurient in that way, but, you know, more often than not, a lot, lots of, this is what we're talking about in the, in the podcast, lots of people go out, don't they, to meet people too. So you, it's an incredibly complicated and nuanced thing because, you know, where is their sort of, uh, harmless flirtation, and where is there something more overt? And I think, you know, that, especially throw alcohol into the mix, and you've got that incredibly complex um, gully, haven't you, between the two. So I, I personally think, the, for me, the idea of playing clothes policemen and women embedded within social situations is good. It presupposes that it only, I mean, I'm presuming this is just one area. You know, it, it doesn't only happen in nightclubs and pubs. It happens on trains, it happens on buses uh, a lot. A lot I've seen it here, where we've had to, we all had to manhandle a guy off a bus who who flashed himself and grabbed at a woman. You know, it's it's. Um... Oh well, Orange Chalmers says it's already been a year since you guys have done the first morning news digest on COVID. Wasn't it called COVID co Coffee Morning or something? Wasn't it Coffee? Yeah. Wow, really? Bloody hell. Henrietta Henson, I remember my dad getting a fight where a man was hitting a woman. Instead of being grateful, she turned on my dad. That's exactly what happened to me. I mean, obviously, that was a that was a situation where you know I get you know I I didn't blame her for it. She was obviously I mean I realised what could have happened after. I was much younger. I was in my twenties. I did the late twenties. You know, I probably made the situation worse for her in some some regards. I mean, it's always bothered me though. That's always bothered me. Um, Sarah Clemmy, mace and pepper spray are illegal in the UK. My uncle told me to carry a taser, but that's illegal too. I mean, I do wonder whether um, we could be more proactive in, you know, sort of advertising campaigns and having, I don't know, like, you know, rather than having to get your phone out and do stuff, because sometimes what happens in a situation, you hear it a lot, is, we, you know, women understandably freeze. I mean, I'm, Maddie was telling me how someone said something to her at a bus stop and she had the idea to sort of shout at him to go away, but she said, I couldn't find my voice, literally couldn't find, you know, you know, this is a, this is a, you know, this is something that isn't just about being able to make rational decisions as a woman when you're faced with this. Because you are BB, because you're petrified, it will make it worse if that person helping will get hurt, says the victim. You're just desperate for them to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. That will have been what, what they were talking about, the woman who I tried to step in and help. Um, so, yeah, so plainclothes, plainclothes police officers is, is one potential solution. Um, I just wanted to pull up, because, but of course there's a lot of people saying that's not enough. And of course it's, it's not enough to patrol pubs and clubs. It, it does happen in all walks of life and in all areas. Um, so yeah, that's that. Um, vaccination, um, going back to the vaccination, obviously NADS, as I've just said, uh, Uh, did you guys see Westminster Bridge was blocked yesterday evening by demonstration? Would have been frightened to have my car surrounded by demonstrators, completely trapped. Um, yeah, I'm looking at the images of of Westminster. Yeah, I mean it's a, it's a demonstration, isn't it? It's uh, I don't I don't think I would have felt threatened. Terrible thing to say, but principally because it was a demonstration, principally composed of women. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I wouldn't have felt threatened, you know, yeah, maybe not pleasant if you weren't expecting to be in there, for sure. Um, over 50 is set to get call up for COVID vaccine, a supply surge means half of adults will get jab. Um, I, touching on this, Europe, I've called it Europe's jab envy. What do you think's all going on? What do you all think's going on with Europe closing down? Do you want to know what the statistics are? 17 million vaccinations. Uh, with Oxford AstraZeneca, 16, sorry, 17 million and 40 blood clots. Four, I'm sorry, I'm just leaving you with that statistic. It's really not a big set of numbers. And there could be, there could be a number of different, different reasons for this. It could be EU's spitting feathers because they don't have enough vaccines and they needed to send a message to their respective populations that there's a different reason for that. You could, I'm sure conspiracy theorists will be arguing or, or you know, not even conspiracy theorists. Is there potentially behind the scenes? If you've ever seen a series like Billions, I'd love, I'd love someone to interrogate whether Pfizer or any of the other vaccine, vaccine makers are fanning the flames of doubt around the Oxford AstraZeneca because there's less money to be made from it. Could be it's just a question worth asking, isn't it? Nothing to do with the validity. The vaccines are good, but could there be sort of corporate machinations in the background? Are they just being salty? As uh, I like that phrase, are they being salty? Says RM's Jams. Um, or is this all part of a sort of EU envy or frustration or attempt to kind of almost by omission? query the success that we're having. As Dawn Claricote says, blood clots happen for lots of reasons. And we were saying this yesterday, we're almost in an existential um, fog of insanity here, potentially, in that for those who are vaccine deniers, you can easily suggest that anyone who has a vaccine, whatever happens to them afterwards, is a cause of the vaccine. But because we can't live two routes of a life, because we get to a fork in the road and we can't test drive one or test drive the other, you can never prove that that wasn't the case. Do you know what I mean? But we have no way of knowing, you know, everyone, everyone heads towards death. And what are we gonna say? That everyone who then now gets a vaccine and hits death in another three years is because of the vaccine. It, it's, it's self fulfilling garbage think. It's called garbage think, that's what I call it. Where you, I mean, so drawing this connection. Now, the European Medical Agency or Medicines Agency is, is reviewing it. The WHO is reviewing it. I think they're having to review it because so many governments have essentially put the brakes on the, on the vaccine. But I, my hunch and my sense is that there's something else behind it. And none of this is, a, is, is about anything we need to, I, I believe, no, there's nothing we need to worry about with the vaccines whatsoever. Uh, there are always side effects to everything. Yes, it's, they've been developed quicker than others, but they, they also were developed using a lot of uh, already existent research and what have you. So let's not get into all of that, yeah? There's something else here. There's something else here. There's something else here. There's, there's, there's saltiness. There's uh, envy. There's frustration. And I think there's a need to keep their own populations, some of these countries, sort of, I think they need to, they're sort of providing a little bit of an excuse. 
A masked kid, people in Australia are panicking about the blood clots. So let me just remind you, 17 million vaccinations, 40 blood clots. It's not a lot. It's not a lot. And there's no way of proving that they were caused by the, by the vaccination or that they weren't going to happen anyway. I just bounced my coffee and Toffee thought it was the postman. Oh, look, there's Nads. She's in bed. Oh, Nads. You're right, darling. Do you want a cup of tea? <laughs> it's like that. Have you seen that uh, that sitcom? What's that sitcom? This is England. Tomato. You're right, Ma. You're right, Ma. Do you want a tomato? Tomato. <laughs> tomato. Oh, here she's she's stumbling down the stairs. Come on, guys. Hit the thumbs up if you like Nad hit the thumbs up icon if you like Nadia Swala off the TV to, to Oh she's wearing a leopard skin. She's wearing a le leopard skin. Oh look at oh look she's managed to make the line. Say hello. Oh sweetie. Oh I was just saying what bad timing to go for a vaccine for the for probably for the first time in your life. Just at the point that the whole world seems to be banning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh sweetie. There I'll tell you, you what though, guys. Lisa had hers yesterday as well at the same time. We were laughing oh, so, so I was much. saying how funny, how funny they were. Oh, you both were. Oh, everyone's sending their hugs. Oh, big hugs, guys. Hit the thumbs up icon for her, guys. Go on. She'll love that. That'll make her day. Oh, but do you know, guys, just don't cancel. If you've got one, just don't. I mean, though I feel rotten. And every and you do feel rotten for a few. Not everyone does. But I, I also feel really relieved that I've, I've had it. I was going to make you one as soon as I finish this, sweetie. I'm, I'm going to finish in a minute. Um, so I call it Europe's jab envy. Um, plain clothes police officers. Inappropriate message from Everard. Uh, Catherine Preston, welcome as a family guest. When Nadia's feeling better, I'll get her to sing you. Can I just say a big thank you to um, Laura Byrne for your lovely card. And that drawing on the front there, a hug for you. Uh, you need to check out this little boy, and he's, I guess, on Instagram, at adventures underscore, I can't read it, is it wool? At adventures underscore wool? Uh, underscore. Uh, I saw him on Ireland's Late Late Christmas toy show. His name is Adam King, and his positivity and smile could invite, would unite countries. He created this hug for you to give people during lockdown and social distancing. Isn't that sweet? So sweet. So Laura Byrne, thank you very much. And thank you for your very, very kind words. Lovely. Um, guys, stay, stay safe. Um, and uh, I'm going to go and um, look, after the, look after the missus. Christine Lampard has had a baby boy. And isn't it lovely? Nadia, oh, so beautiful. Nadia was uh, yeah, sharing the... Well, not sharing images, but she was sharing the news with me last night. Um, I, I didn't want to say to her that actually uh, she, she'd let me know already. I'm, I'm high up in her contacts list, you see. So group hug, coming in. Guys, as I said, um, the cooking, the cooking, cook along madness isn't gonna happen tonight. We're gonna do that tomorrow night. Um, a vlog will be going up later today of more insanity. I mean, I don't think we're gonna be able to better the behind the scenes hello shoot, but you never know. I never, I'm always surprised by what there is when I go to edit them. So uh, speak to you later. Oh, hang on, news just breaking. PC Wayne Cousins due to stand trial. Um, hang on, where's it gone? Sky News. Do, 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 do. Did you see he was yawning when he was taking it? Yeah, yeah, he was yawning. That was nice, wasn't it? That was nice. Wayne Cousins due to stand trial in October after appearing in court charged with Sarah Everard's kidnap and murder. Um, scar was visible on the officer's forehead and around his left eye. Uh, uh, the Independent Office for Police Complaints is investigating how he received those injuries. I hope they also investigate the, they're investigating the officer who sent the uh, graphic inappropriate comedy posts about the uh, crime site. I don't want anyone to let go of that. Post about it on your social media and keep it in the news, in the news flow. It's outrageous. Um, a post-mortem has been carried out, sadly, but no cause of death. Death has yet been released. Um, oh makes my blood boil. Guys, stay safe. Um, look after your loved ones, look after yourselves, and um, we will see you certainly live tomorrow morning, but there'll definitely be some other content landing later today.
All right, guys. Lots of love. Bye.